welcome to everybody that has joined us this morning. My name is Jenny Thompson. I'm not on the screen. I'm with UW Extension, but also with the Barnyards and Backyards Project, which involves a lot of different organizations, including UW Extension, Conservation Districts, Audubon Rockies, um, Department of Ag, NRCS, and several others. So we're very happy to have you here this morning. And Donna uh, Hoffman is our host. She just bopped in back in on a different link. She's not Jacqueline Downey, that is Donna Hoffman. She's with UW Extension. She'll be your host this morning. And some kind of housekeeping details before we get started. If you'd like to, if you're on Zoom and you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, go ahead and use your the Q&A feature and pop that open and type it in and we'll get it. If you're on Facebook Live, go ahead and type your comments or questions in as comments on Facebook, and I will be bopping over there to look and see what the questions are, and I'll pass them on to the host. Donna, are you connected with your audio? I am. I don't know awesome. what happened, but I think I closed the show for just a second there and luckily had the link handy so I could join back. Welcome Great. to Barnyards and Backyards Live for Friday, March 24th. Um, I we're we're really happy to be here. So did you already do the intro? Yeah, I did the intro. So if you want to just go ahead and introduce yourself right. and then introduce right. Zach, we'll get right okay. into it. All right. So I'm Donna Hoffman. I'm the horticulture educator in the Natrona County Extension Office in Casper. And um, I have the uh, pleasure of working with Zach also here in Casper on a fairly regular basis, although we haven't probably seen each other since the pandemic started but um, it's nice to know that we have resources like Zach uh, in the community and available to help with things across the state of Wyoming. So Zach Hutchinson has joined us uh, spur of the moment this morning and is going to share with us his wealth of knowledge about hummingbirds. And uh, Jenny and I will try to help support that conversation on uh, the plants that, that they enjoy feeding on um, and we can add to our landscapes so that we can see more of those beautiful little things. Excellent, thank you, Donna. So your regularly uh, scheduled rock star presenter, Jacqueline Downey, um, was unable to make it. And so I'm the backup vocalist. Um, and unfortunately the backup vocalist is dealing with strep, but I'm going to battle through. I may have to take a pause here and there for some throat spray, um, but we're gonna battle through this and have some fun um, learning about hummingbirds. So uh, let me share my screen and we will get started. <clears throat> so we'll focus on uh, attracting hummingbirds to your home garden. Um, you know, a lot of folks will use feeders to do, do this, but we're going to focus more on uh, the natural side of providing natural food sources to uh, lure in those flying gems. We're going to tackle this in three parts, um, just an overview of hummingbirds in general. Um, and then looking specifically at which hummingbirds are we likely to find in our state. Um, and then we're going to go to the how to's of hummingbird gardens, you know, how to design it, what plants to select. And then finally, we'll, we'll wrap up um, on the community science and, you know, uh, helping to be a, a conservation hero for hummingbirds, looking at our Habitat Hero program, and then how to record your hummingbird observations so that uh, scientists, conservationists um, can use that, that data then to help better protect uh, hummingbirds at large. Um, so those of you who don't know uh, who we are, Audubon Rockies, we are a regional office of the National Audubon Society. So we cover Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah. Um, we reach outside of those states a little bit too into other states that don't have their own offices. Um, a few of our core programs, this is just a handful, uh, the Habitat Hero program, which is our, our plants for birds, meaning, you know, creating, habitat in your own yard. Um, we have our community naturalist program, which is our education and outreach, Western Rivers, which focuses on, on getting water back into our Western Rivers, into our riparian corridors, um, and then sagebrush ecosystem protects sagebrush um, and the, the vast number of organisms that depend upon it, and our conservation ranching program, which is uh, a program built to help grassland birds and the, the working lands people that use those grasslands. So let's jump into hummingbirds and you're going to see um, some just, you know, fantastic photos of hummingbirds that we just, we don't get to see in Wyoming, unfortunately, but our hummingbirds are pretty special too. So let's not cut them short, but you're going to see like these booted racket tails. 
these are uh, these are uh, a Central South American specialty that you know we just don't see up here. They don't migrate up here. Um, but uh, there's some fantastic photography of hummingbirds from across the Western Hemisphere, um, and you'll find out why why I say across the Western Hemisphere only um, in just a bit. So you know some of these birds don't expect to see them here, but appreciate the fact that uh, they exist in this world. So let's talk first about the hummingbirds and their food needs. Well, they're hungry because they have these high metabolisms, small bodies, high metabolisms. They need to feed a lot. Um, and and uh, oftentimes they'll need to consume two to three times their own body weight every day just to maintain their body weight. And then if they want to put fat on, they'll have to overconsume consume that. Um, and they'll do that with a, a majority of their food supply coming from nectar, especially during migration seasons. Um, in the summertime, you'll see them switch to an, a diet that consists of a lot of native insects, small native flying insects, which also depend upon native plants. So these native plants serve a dual purpose of they can provide nectar to the hummingbirds for that instant, you know, refuel. But then also hummingbirds need these small invertebrates because of the proteins, uh, the vitamins and minerals. And then, you know, when they're feeding their chicks in the nest, to grow feathers is a high energy cost that requires more than just sugar water. It requires the minerals and compounds to build those feathers in the body. And so having uh, native insects is a big part of that. And so growing native plants also grows native insects that birds like hummingbirds need. Zach, I'm going to interject here just yeah. a second. One of, one of my favorite memories is learning about hummingbirds eating insects. Of course, we all grow up doing hummingbird feeders so we knew that they did nectar and things but um watching them kind of dive bomb and catching insects um, mid-flight um, is pretty amazing to watch um, they're pretty good camouflage in evergreen trees and then they can just dive out and grab those insects mid-flight so that that was pretty cool to watch so it's it's fun to watch them at the feeders of course but watching them in the forest especially catching native insects is pretty cool yeah yeah they're they're great fly catchers you'll see them they'll do their aerial displays but then as donna said that you see them do these amazing hunting maneuvers to capture small flying insects and they'll also eat aphids which aphid you know then you get the, the benefit of the insect and the aphid is full of sugar water as well so <laughs> it's you know it's a it's like a eating a, a, an orange or something like that. It's full of, you know, uh, juices as well as it's got some other nutrients that you need. So it's great. Dinner with dessert involved. <laughs> right, yeah, all in one bite, bite-sized. Um, okay, so their beaks. Um, obviously, hummingbirds have very specialized beaks. Now, when you go down into the tropics, you see even more specialization in these beaks. Uh, you can see this, uh, this sword bill here. Um, this is a hummingbird that feeds on, on very long tubular plants, and so it needs that very long uh, bill to help feed in those. And so um, their bills are adapted to the flowers that, you know, whichever species they are that they primarily feed on. And so as we go through this presentation, you're going to see birds like hermits um, and things like that. And you're going to see some with like, you know, scythe and scimitar like bills that are very curved and, and you know, unique angles and it's because of the flowers they feed on although some then their bills you'll see they're very short and sharp and it's because they'll actually pierce the base of the flower and they'll take the nectar out that way and so they don't always feed through the top although most of our north american species we don't see them piercing the flowers very often um, that's more more common in some other species in central and south america <laughs> as you all probably know Hummingbirds are mini helicopters um, and yet even better than helicopters because they can maneuver in all planes, upside down, right side up, backwards, frontwards, diagonal. It does not matter. They have capabilities to, to maneuver um, so many different directions. They are the all stars of flying in the bird world. Everyone wants to talk about what's the fastest bird in the world. Well, the fastest bird in the world can really only go one direction and that's forward. Hummingbirds can go in every direction and they can go fast and they can outmaneuver just about anything you could imagine. You know, small insects might be the exception because they also have amazing flight capabilities, um, but hummingbirds are highly specialized and it's what allows them then, you know, you don't typically see them at flowers perching to feed, they feed on the wing. Um, now with hummingbird feeders, uh, they have perches built onto them oftentimes and you'll see them perch to feed. 
but out, out at flowers, rarely do you see them perching to feed. Um, I've seen it a couple of times where, you know, especially on something like milkweed that's got big, robust leaves. I've seen rufous hummingbirds perch on a leaf and then dip down um, into the flowerets and, and feed that way. But it's just not something you see very often. And it's because they have this amazing ability uh, to feed on the wing like that. It's pretty amazing that they continue to burn energy as they're feeding. <laughs> right. And you know, they have um, this amazing um, energy system to where maximum efficiency because they are getting maximum oxygen. And so, you know, they're using their energy at the highest efficiency of some of the animal kingdom. Um, if you look at their muscle tissue, it is the darkest of purple, meaning their, their cells are, are packed, you know, with oxygen rich um, platelets. And then uh, the, the, they've also got, uh, you know, just massive mitochondria that, that help to power their, their cells of their body so that they're getting maximum efficiency from every last little drop of that, that sweet, sweet nectar. Hmm. Um, so what we've got here, um, I, I wanted to, before we talk about the, the next two facts on the screen, I mentioned that specialized bill. So on the bird on the left, that's a hermit. You see that, that really curved bill and that's because of the flowers that this bird is likely to feed on. Um, so I mentioned earlier, we, we're gonna see birds from across the Western hemisphere. Well, that's because there are no hummingbirds outside of the Western Hemisphere. So North America, Central America, South America, that's it. Africa, Asia, Europe, no hummingbirds. Australia, no hummingbirds. Instead, they have sunbirds, but sunbirds, um, while they do fill a similar role as hummingbirds, they don't have these amazing capabilities of, of flight um, and some of the other amazing capabilities we see hummingbirds have. And so sunbirds in the Eastern Hemisphere kind of fill that role that hummingbirds have in the Western Hemisphere but hummingbirds are only found here. So uh, we are really fortunate to live on the side of the world that has these amazing and stunning creatures. Yeah. Um, and they are solitary. Uh, so, you know, we don't see them flock up except for, uh, you know, when they're, when they're getting food at a feeder, you know, or when they're fighting, right? There's territorial disputes. When they migrate, you'll see, you know, small groups and it's generally because they're migrating through an area that has a food source that they can all use. Um, and, and some hummingbirds even lek. So uh, similar to what we see with grouse, right? Where the grouse all gather up and the males display. Hermits are actually uh, known to do some lecking behavior where males will gather up and display and females will come in and choose their mates. Um, most of our North American hummingbirds, eh, they're not gonna do that. But as you go further south, um, south of the US border into Mexico, which is still North America, but even further south into Central America, then you see more and more hummingbird species. And yeah, some of them lek. And so you'll see them gather like that. But otherwise, they're not typically hanging out in flocks like we see, you know, with uh, winter finches, for example. There's, they seem to be so territorial around feed, feeders or where there is food that it's kind of surprising that some of them can stand to be around each other long enough to, to do those displays um, that you think of with with our sage grouse here in Wyoming. Right, and I, I think it helps that, you know, in the tropics with those species, um, more permanent food sources, you know, year round where they're not, and they're not migrating, right? They're, they're residents, they're stuck there. And so um, for them, it probably also makes it easier to find each other in those thick forests. So pl a plentiful food supply allows them to come closer together then. Yes, yeah, the more okay. food they have available, um, <clears throat> you're still gonna see that territorial dispute, doesn't matter. Um, they just, you know, they like to protect their food sources, but um, the more food availability, then, you know, the, the greater chance you can have more hummingbirds in those areas, especially during migration. Very interesting. Just to interject for those of you watching this morning, um, if you have questions, um, if you find that Q&A section, um, drop your questions in the Q&A section and we will try to get those answered. Um, so as, as nesters, hummingbirds build um, some of the most <clears throat> impressive nests and not size wise, right? Like bald eagles build impressive nests and they're, you know, grandiose and they're massive and they're just impressive. But hummingbirds actually build nests that are expandable. They're built to grow. Um, and so when they lay, you know, the tiny nest, you know, um, if, you, if you make a, a C with your hands and then put those C's together, you know, that's probably about as big as a hummingbird nest is going to be at start. And then the eggs are laid 
and the chicks generally hatch facing two different directions for maximum uh, ability to, to fit inside this tiny nest. Um, and because these nests are, um, are made of, of a lot of spider webs, especially in spider web, you know, the tensile strength of spider web is so impressive. They're built with this material that allows for flexing. As the chicks grow then, the nest flexes and stretches so that the chicks, as they're growing, the nest grows with them. Um, and so hummingbirds are amazing, amazing uh, mothers. The, the males are not typically involved in the nests. Um, and so you'll only see the females going to the nest, which is why they're, they're so hard to find because the males are out here doing these flamboyant displays of you know, dive bombs and, and sound making, especially our broad tail hummingbirds, which are, are our summer nesters throughout most of the state. And then the females are quietly sneaking in, getting a little bit of food and flying back to the nest and they don't make a sound. And so that's why it's so hard to find these because the males are all about, look at me. And the females are like, and it, it, so it's difficult to find them because they're so well camouflaged and they're so small. I um, mean, when the eggs are, are laid, you know, uh, jelly bean to Tic Tac size, they're very, very small. Um, and, uh, and the female will, will incubate them using, especially, uh, so in a lot of birds, they get brood patches, these bare spots on their bellies. Hummingbirds don't do that. Instead, um, with our broad tail hummingbirds, especially the females, their legs swell up with fluid, the tops of their legs, um, they swell up with fluid. And so then they actually, their legs kind of then allow for that heat transfer from their bodies into the eggs. And that's how the incubation hmm. occurs. Very interesting. It is. Mothers, and mothers are, are so known for saying quiet. The kids are sleeping. <laughs> and quiet. Don't let anyone know where they're sleeping. Right. Okay, so the hummingbirds we would expect in, in the, the cowboy state here, um, our, our most common species is the broad-tailed hummingbird. Um, it ranges throughout most of the state. It is our, our typical breeder. It's the loud one that you hear buzzing by, makes that, uh, that loud sound as it flies by. Um, and found throughout the state, um, and you'll see it, uh, it times its arrival and its departure based on certain blooms. Um, now, it's not the first arrival. Um, that actually belongs to the next one on this slide, the calliope hummingbird, which is the smallest hummingbird uh, in North America, um, the smallest bird in North America, then that also means. So the calliope hummingbird is one of the earliest arrivals. In fact, I've already seen reports in Utah that calliopes are on their way back north. Um, I've seen records of calliope humming, hummingbirds showing up in Montana in as early as now in Montana. So further north than us, and they're all, you know, they might already be there in some places. They're a very hardy bird. Even though they're this tiny little bird, they're extremely hardy and capable of dealing with the, the cold temperatures and the late snows. Um, and so the habitat for each of these is a little bit different, more montane for the broad tail, um, willow and riparian for the calliope. Um, some of the best spots to see the calliopes uh, in, in Wyoming are the, the bighorns and then further to the Northwest, you know, into the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Whereas broad tails, um, throughout most of the state, there's a good chance to see them, except for out in the plains. They're not going to breed out there, but they will migrate through. So if you have the right plants up at the right time, uh, great way to, to try to lure them in and give them a little, a little treat and a little support as they're, they're moving onto their breeding grounds. Um, some of the others we see, the rufous hummingbird is uh, a hummingbird that migrates through only. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't know if we have any confirmed breeding records for them. They, they breed further north in the Pacific Northwest, all the way up into Alaska. Um, they're more common in the fall, and we use fall pretty loosely. Really, mid-July through September, October is, is a great time to see the rufous hummingbirds. Um, again, you just need to make sure you've got the plants out to attract them. The males are the first to come through in July. So if you want like the one that looks like the photo here on the slide, well, they come through early because as soon as they have bred and defended their territories and they're done breeding, then they'll already start that migration south. And so we'll see them as early as mid-July. So you'll, you'll uh, want to look for the males then. And they are the bullies at the feeders. They're smaller than broad tails, um, but they are uh, some of the biggest bullies at feeders and at flower uh, gardens, you know, it, it doesn't matter the food source, they will chase other birds away and you'll see them flying around looking all, you know, big and mean and tough and oh, stay away from all of this. Um, so they uh, found uh, throughout the state migrating through and, and you'll see them making a real ruckus at uh, whatever food source you have. Then we have the, the yeah. We do have a question in the Q&A. 
um, since hummingbirds are kind of solitary creatures to a point, uh, are they more or less likely to get affected by the avian, the bird avian flu? Um, so less, less likely. Um, I, so far, uh, I don't know of any um, known knowledge that it affects hummingbirds at all. Um, and uh, in fact, most songbirds are unaffected by it. Um, so really, uh, you know, most of our, our smaller birds are, are generally not at risk from avian influenza. Um, there's just, there's not a lot of, you know, research wise and just uh, observation wise, everything points to most of our small birds seem to actually be safe from it. It's our, it's our large waterfowl and game birds that suffer the most. So hummingbirds likely to be some of the safest from uh, avian influenza impacts. Good Great. question. Jenny has put some uh, resources in the chat. Excellent. Okay. All right. Um, so then black chin hummingbird found southern part of the state through the western fringes of the state. So uh, snowy range, Sierra Madres, um, and down around the, that southwest corner of the state. Um, you're going to find them especially in the, the riparian areas in Wyoming. They are moving up mountains a little bit more and more. They're kind of expanding the habitat that they're using, um, but especially lower areas, uh, good preference for that. But yeah, southern part of the state, um, not eastern, not southeastern part, but kind of south central to southwestern and up the western fringes. Um, they do breed in some of those areas in the state. Otherwise, you'll see them migrating through those areas. Um, we don't get them outside of there very often. I've seen one here in Casper once in migration, and that was it. Um, so not common throughout much of the rest of the state. And if it's a female, they can be a real challenge to identify, even with the help of some of the resources we're going to show you. And here's one of those resources, the Audubon Bird Guide. So if you want to know, hey, are hummingbirds being seen in my area yet? Um, well, you can go and use the Audubon Bird Guide app um, and use the Find Birds with eBird, locate birds seen around you recently. You'll go to that and it'll tell you, you know, how far north have the hummingbirds made it in our area? Um, and so it's, it's a great resource to use to see, okay, are the hummingbirds here yet? Are they here yet? Now, of course, if you go outside and you hear a hummingbird, well, that answers the question better than the app can, right? But you know, if, if you're unsure and if you're like, did I hear a hummingbird? I think I heard a hummingbird. I'm going to go look. Great way to confirm your suspicions if you, if you think you heard one, but you're not sure. Um, another great app to, to help identify some hummingbirds is the Cornell Bird ID app, um, the Merlin Bird ID app uh, from Cornell. And it, um, it does identification in a couple of different ways. If you get a photo, you can upload the photo onto it and it'll use uh, an algorithm to help identify it. And it's a, it's a pretty strong algorithm that does a really good job, um, but also, you can go through and identify it uh, walking through step by step and picking, you know, certain things, the size of the bird, the colors of the bird, what was it doing, and uh, it'll try to identify it that way. Um, it usually gives you several birds to pick from, which if you're indecisive and you're not sure already, that might make it even harder, but um, it at least narrows the selections down for you. As you saw with hummingbirds, though, we only have a handful in the state and only uh, a few are here uh, throughout most of the summer, so uh, makes it pretty easy. And they're all, you know, other, the, the females can be difficult to identify, but the males are, you know, quite lovely and uh, their identification is a little bit easier. Okay, so that's part one. That's the Hummingbirds 101. So let's jump into part two, um, gardens as habitat. Um, and so when you're, when you're thinking about your garden, you're going to want to, you know, and many of you probably already have this, right? You already know where your garden's located. It's already set there and you're ready to go. Um, but for those who don't, or if you think about expanding, Think about, you know, where the, the location of the garden is going to go in, what size is it going to be, and, and to, you know, to what scale um, are, you know, e each part, you know, each part of the whole, how big is that going to be? Are you going to, you know, switch your whole yard to a, a native habitat? Or are you just going to do patches or, you know, pieces? Um, are you just doing a few pots maybe around your home? You know, think about that. Think about your vertical space. Maybe you don't have a lot of space to build out. You know, you can't go horizontally. So, go vertically. Think about how you can maximize vertical space with hanging plants, um, you know, pots, hanging pots, or, or you know, tiered stacked uh, garden boxes, you know, whatever it is that you can maximize, maximize that space um, to, you know, attract, attract more birds and offer more feeding opportunities. 
Um, a, a great you know, thing that you can do, as many of you probably already know, is you know, sketch out the space that you're gonna utilize to help visualize it. Um, you know, and if you can put measurements to it, you know, put some measurements to it and write those measurements down you know, as part of your sketch so that you can really maximize how you're visualizing the, the use of the space. And then, you know, uh, with all the great resources that Barnyards and Backyards has, um, Audubon has resources as well. Do research and look, you know, for, you know, similar spaces and how they look and how you could, you know, model after it or capture certain ideas from it for your own space. Um, and so you can see one of the best things about winter is that planning time. And now that we're getting into the early spring, garden catalogs are coming. So um, great opportunities to sh to shop through pictures and and kind of pick out ones that you want to use in your your uh, in your garden to enhance it for a variety of birds, but hummingbirds especially today. Absolutely, yeah, nothing but planning in winter time for me. Not a lot else happening in my yard. <laughs> it's a tundra out there. Um, so you know, you look at this this image and it looks like oh, there's so much here, but. This is actually a pretty small space and we don't have a before photo, unfortunately, but if we did, you would see there's a sidewalk running through this up to that back door and there's just a narrow strip on, on each side. And, and, you know, they maximize that space with um, a variety of native plants, not just, uh, you know, flowering ones that, that provide nectar, but other ones that are going to provide sources of food for insects that, that all birds need. Um, and so, uh, Donna, I'll let you kind of talk about some of the plants we're seeing in this, in this photo. Um, if you'd like, and, you know, um, some of the benefits that, that they have and, you know, the, how they can grow in, in places. Sure. Right, right in the very front, uh, in the lower left-hand corner, I see a purple penstemon and um, those tube shaped flowers are the main key to saying, yes, this is a good plant for hummingbirds. So anything that's got a long, um, deep flower that, that will hold nectar, um, are great sources of, of nutrient and energy for the hummingbirds. And then the, the big um, flowers in this picture are the, uh, the columbines. So there's a yellow one in the forefront, foreground and a pink and yellow one kind of in the background there. Um, and then I see just in front of the door, uh, it has the shadow of the glass or the reflection of the glass. Uh, there's some whirling gara in that picture as well. And I think there is a white columbine off on the right hand side, kind of behind some of the grass that's in the foreground. So lots of columbine. Um, most of these are fairly soft colored flowers, but oftentimes hummingbirds are very well attracted to the, the what we think of as warm colors. So the yellows, oranges, and reds. Um, in the garden. And then, like I mentioned with the penstemon there in the foreground, that's a, a purple, um, some of the purple blue flowers um, are that shape that the hummingbirds like. Excellent. Thank you. Is that uh, in front of the go away sign? I see some purple ones popping up there. Can you, is that, is that? A that might be maybe? a monarda. Yeah. yeah. We saw that in a picture earlier and I, yeah, that's, there are some there. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So you can see maximize space. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know how long it took them to, to get this all together, but they, they really maximized space for, for not just pollinate uh, hummingbirds as the only pollinators interested in the space, but a variety of pollinators would be interested as well. Um, now this is some, some blanket flower from Jacqueline's own home. Uh, looks like it may be in a, in a pot um, on, on her porch. Um, you can see there's a big bushy plant in the back there. And while blanket flower may be uh, not the most optimal one for attracting hummingbirds, you know, the bright colors will still lure them in. If they don't get a high nectar reward from that plant, um, studies show that, you know, color is great maybe at first attracting, but a hummingbird will inspect multiple colors across the spectrum of colors. They'll, they'll check them all out. And the ones that give the highest nectar reward are the ones they will return to. So it might come in seeing this bright red flower first, try it out, very minimal nectar reward because it doesn't have that, you know, that nice tube shape with a lot of nectar. And then they might move to another plant nearby that maybe does have a higher nectar reward. And then they'll return to that one again and again because of the nectar reward. And there's, there's lots and lots of research on this that yes, red typically is the thing that attracts them the fastest, but 
they are attracted to almost all colors and the ones with the highest reward are the ones that they will return to again and again. So you don't only have to have red to attract hummingbirds, but it is a good trick to get them in fast. Yeah, I, this is Jenny. I have penstemons that are purplish blue color and they love them. They'll visit them a lot and catmen and wells also, which is a blue purple color. So it's not just the reds. Yeah, yeah, they, they do good on, on white flowers as well. Um, the ones that uh, one of our research stations on Casper Mountain here, um, they go they go wild for some of the, the white flowers up there because they have high nectar rewards. Um, so, you know, when you're when you're thinking about about planting, um, you know, uh, it's it's good idea. You know, these birds are adapted to the plants that you know they have lived with for a very long time, and so it's a great idea to to plant plants that. They know. So going, uh, you know, and getting plants that are native to this region. Now, it's not always maybe the easiest to find plants that are from your exact area. Um, I know it can be, you know, difficult to, to find, you know, plants sourced from, you know, very locally. So, you know, regionally, uh, you know, uh, native plants are, are a great idea, you know, and, and sometimes you can only find, you know, the, you know, the horticulture specialty of, of a plant that's native to your area, you know, but when you go with those, Typically, they're going to provide the nectar rewards that these hummingbirds are used to. They're going to require, you know, lesser water and, and maybe lesser attention to some extent after they get up and going. Um, and so, um, you know, that's something to consider, uh, you know, versus, you know, some of the ones that, that, that come from, you know, the eastern hemisphere and the hummingbirds, they just, they don't know these plants very well. And these plants may not give the nectar reward in the way that hummingbirds are used to. So something to think about there. Um, some other considerations. When are the flowers blooming? For hummingbirds, um, if you want to keep hummingbirds, you know, you want to have them around throughout much of the year, you need, you know, you're gonna, you need flowers that bloom early uh, for the, the early arriving hummingbirds, provide a food source for them and something that can stand up, you know, to those late spring storms. You want something that blooms throughout the summer to, to continue feeding those hummingbirds throughout the summer. And then you're going to want a late fall bloomer as well, um, because, you know, we get Rufus hummingbirds. Um, we've even had Anna's hummingbird. There's a record of that that showed up in the bighorns in late October, early November. So, you know, late blooming flowers that hold on uh, to their blooms and still provide some nectar resource late into the fall. Um, you know, those are great ways to then get some of those late birds and help them out and, uh, you know, continue giving you some sightings late into the year. Um, you want to think about the shapes. The, the tube ones generally have the greatest nectar um, reward and that's that's the big thing it's that all about that nectar they want lots of nectar and so if the flower gives up lots of it that's that's the one they're going to go to um the reds orange and pinks it gets their attention early so if you can find a, a tube nectar with a tube flower with a lot of nectar that's red orange and pink hey you know go there first but you can have other colors as well that they will use again if there's a reward it's all about that sugar water they want that sugar water um and then you know, you can clump the plants together, especially the same species, you know, um, so that they can feed in a small area and get a lot of nectar really quickly rather than having to move across, you know, an area. Unless, of course, that's the space you have, in which case you work with the space you have and do the best you can with what you have. Um, just, you know, something to consider. The more you can pack into that area where they can move less to feed, um, the more time they'll spend in that area and oftentimes defend it quite vigorously. Um, so we've got some resources. I think these links are either in the chat or going to be in the chat. Um, and we're going to actually, I'm going to show you how to use the Audubon native plant database. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll go through it together here on kind of how to use it and how to, how to sort through it um, for hummingbirds. And I'll give you a brief show on how to do it for others as well. Um, so instead of using this, we're actually, I'm going to go back and we're going to open this up. So I think my screen, I'm going to stop sharing that. And I'm going to start sharing this and I'm going to walk us through how to do it. And this, this link should be in the chat or it will be. So give it a moment if it's not. Now, um, when you come here, right here, um, you, you go to the link and here is the native plant database. Um, now I think also the, the Ladybird Johnson uh, native plant resource guide has something like this as well. It's a little less intuitive and not able to filter by bird, um, but it, it is a resource out there as well. Um, you can type in your zip code. You do not have to use your email address, but 
if you want the list sent to you, you will have to do that. You won't be able to just download the list. So to get it sent to you, you'll want to um, email, email it to yourself. So you do that. Um, so zip code for Casper here, I'm gonna do that. Those two things, enter them in. And it's gonna pull up a large number of results. Now, you can filter it by plants. So right here, all types of plants, all plant resources, or what it attracts. And in this case, we want hummingbirds. So I'm going to open this drop down list, select hummingbirds. Okay. And then it's going to give me some birds uh, or some flowers, I mean, some, some plants that are, are good for attracting hummingbirds. And so then it'll give you the plant, uh, common, one of the common names, scientific name. Um, and then uh, it'll tell you over here birds that it attracts. And you can see hummingbirds is on the list. And it gives you some information on, um, you know, what uh, what it needs to, to grow. Um, and you can add it to your plant list. Um, you can use the buy now as well, though it may may not work uh, depending on where you're at. So uh, just keep that in mind. You can just download it. Um, but you go through and it gives you some options. Some of them might not be as uh, locally native and more regionally native. It really just depends um, on kind of where you're at and what your your habitat is where you're at because it's using you know zip codes which don't necessarily uh understand elevation and things like that so take that into consideration um but these are all at least uh you know native flowers to some extent um showing milkweed is a is a nice late bloomer that i see rufus hummingbirds using late late into the year um and so you know, it's it's one that's good. If you want something that's red, tubular, and and gives off some good nectar, um, the skyrocket here is a great one. Uh, we we talked about the Monarda. We called it Bee Bomb. Here you'll see it's got a different name. Um, but uh, you know, regardless of the common name, it gives you a variety of of options. And it, it, here it's only showing seven. Um, if I use this different zip code, it may add more because there, there's a lot more than just seven plants that you can use. And that guide that um, is also in the resources, it's gonna have some more options for you as well um, because there are, are more. Yeah, Zach, this is Jenny. I went ahead and put the page from the pollinator guide that had that list of native plants for hummingbirds and for okay. folks on Zoom and I also put a link on it in Facebook. Um, I just wanted to mention that scarlet gilia that he was showing. <laughs> excuse me, it's a super cool plant, but it is a biennial. So you may not see it in the nurseries because sometimes they don't like selling plants that are gonna die in two years because people get grumpy. So you, there's ones like that, that it's are quite easy to start from seed that you can give it a whirl and see how it goes and just let them, uh, you stick them somewhere where they're gonna reseed a little bit and then they'll kind of keep their own little population going out once they get started. Sorry, Donna, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. Um, we do have a question in the Q and A, and it is: um, Do the hummingbird or hawk moths deter hummingbirds from coming into the landscape? And I had a question looking at that scarlet gilia. Um, you know that red shaped color and the tubular flowers of our state flower. I'm curious if that if the Indian paintbrush is a hummingbird attractant. Okay, so let me. We do the hawk moth one first. So um, sphinx moths, no, uh, they they do not deter hummingbirds because um, you know they feed at a completely different time of day. Um, most of the time, by the time sphinx moths have come out, hummingbirds have moved. If anything, the hummingbirds would deter the sphinx moths, and so the sphinx moths may only feed closer to nocturnal times because uh, during the day they would uh, be at risk of being outcompeted by hummingbirds, and then obviously predators feeding upon them. So, um, you know, humming, hummingbird moths, hawk moths, sphinx moths, whatever you call them, they are of no threat to hummingbirds. Now, uh, in their caterpillar stage, are they maybe a threat to a tomato or two? That's a different story for a different presentation. Um, but as, as adults feeding at flowers, no, they're of no concern to hummingbirds whatsoever. Um, now, let's see, Donna, to your question, uh, Indian paintbrush. So, they will come into it, but they do not feed at it regularly in what I've seen. And I think it's just because of the nectar reward. They would have to feed it a lot of little, you know, um, is it the, their flowerettes, right? Creating the whole mm -hmm. thing. And mm -hmm. so I think feeding it too many little flowerettes for too little resource is just 
not efficient feeding for them, but the, it does at least attract their attention initially because of that red coloration. Okay. Yeah. Curiosity. Um, and, yeah, and, and we, I called I called it skyrocket because that's what it was listed on the site. But what I called the the scarlet skyrocket, which you saw listed on the website, scarlet skyrocket is what uh, mm -hmm. Donna and Jenny both uh, the scarlet gilia, and that's what most people in Wyoming call it. I called it skyrocket because that's I was just reading off the screen. I was being silly. Scarlet gilia is what most people call it here, and it is pretty common throughout much of the state. I think maybe more common on the western side of the state. It's one of the things all of us plant fans get used to is different groups of people or wherever they're you know different nat nativities they uh, have different names for um, plants and one of the benefits of using the scientific name although most of us know plants as their common name so yeah. anyway it all works <laughs> all right so let's jump back in here um now when i said think vertically earlier i was talking about you know planting vertically but also we need to think vertically in terms of habitat structure Hummingbirds need a place to feed, but also they need a place to roost and nest. So that means safety. Um, and you know, while flowering plants uh, can provide some safety for small creatures like insects, hummingbirds need uh, a little bit more consideration for, for vertical structure and safety. And so that means woody plants. So trees and shrubs. Think about you know, what, what ones do you already have and what could you plant you know, native that uh, hummingbirds would use? Um, I know for me, um, I believe I have a nest in, uh, uh, a Rocky Mountain maple um, in, in my backyard. Um, and then I've got tons of uh, choke cherry just surrounding my property here. Um, and it's so thick in the summertime. If I did have a nest in there, I would never know because I can't ever see anything in mm -hmm. it. It's so thick. Um, but that's the point. The hummingbirds want that because that female wants to go into a dark, quiet area um, where they can, you know, build that nest in a little, in a little spot and not be disturbed because they're protected from predators um, and unwanted eyes. So, you know, consider the vertical woody structure because it's very important to these birds. They need places for protection as well. Um, other considerations, you know, plants that maybe hummingbirds, they, they wouldn't use for food, but they might use for nesting material. So, um, you know, things like, um, you know, native thistles and, and things uh, like, you know, small asters that they give off the little fluffs, like dandelion, things like that uh, are good for nest building. Spider webs. So, you know, even if you hate spiders, if you can leave the ones outside alone, at least, you know, the ones inside, you want to knock down the cobwebs. Okay, I kind of get it, whatever. But the ones outside, if you could at least leave those, the hummingbirds will take those, those spider webs down and they will use them and they will then use them to build the nest. You kind of see it actually on this nest here. You can see lichen, um, you can see some spider web, you can see some hair um, and some plant material mixed in there as well. And so all of these things, you know, uh, that our native plants produce and, and our native uh, arthropods produce critical to building the nest. So just, you know, things to keep in the back of your mind of, hey, that's good nesting material. We shouldn't mess too much with that. Um, other things you can you can consider you know to to supplement having a fresh water source is great. Um, I will say, hummingbirds don't like deep bird baths. So if you have a bird bath, if it's deep, they will not bathe in it because of the risk of of drowning or uh, being caught off guard by a predator in it. So you'll see in this photo on the left, the Allen's hummingbird, it's using um, it's like a it's like a a, bab, a, a bubbler type of thing where it's it's not even a quarter of an inch deep of water running over the stone and that's what the hummingbirds using now if you have the ability to create a drip feature hummingbirds uh, sometimes will sit under a drip feature if they can you know sit closely and under a rock and let it go over them but they really like these bubblers that have very shallow shallow water um, so if you have something deeper deeper you'll want to consider how to uh, how to make it shallow for hummingbirds to use. You can put rocks and things like that in to help. Um, you can use uh, nectar feeders, but do consider that they do require a lot of upkeep and maintenance and that you need to change the nectar every three to four days in the summertime. The heat causes mold to grow within that nectar. And so you have to keep up on it to make sure you're not putting your hummingbirds at risk. So if, if you know maintenance is not something you can do, then flowers are the, the great resource because they'll continue to produce the nectar for the hummingbirds and you don't have to change it then. 
right? You don't have to clean the feeders because every time you clean the nectar out, then you need to clean those feeders as well. So you can consider a hummingbird feeder, but also consider, you know, uh, you know how much you can put into that because if you're not doing enough upkeep, it can negatively impact your hummingbirds. You know, so consider it as a supplement, but if you don't need it um, because you have plenty of flowers out, well, then the hummingbirds will appreciate that as well. Yeah, Zach, this is Jenny. I used to have hummingbird feeders out and I was too lazy and busy to keep them up. And so eventually I planted enough plants that I didn't need them as much anymore. And so I don't get them quite as early as some of the folks that put, have out the feeders, but it's a lot less work on my part. I know a lot of people sometimes worry if the feeding them nectar is somehow going to bother them. And so maybe you can address that as far as looks like you got a visitor there. I know. As far She's as, heard me talking. yeah, as far as you're not um, like causing them nutritional problems or causing them not to visit by plants by using feeders, right? Right. Yeah. So there's ample studies out there that show bird feeders, birds don't, they don't depend upon them. They're supplementary only. They still go out and find natural food sources. And so um, when you put up a feeder, you're not, you're not causing any sort of deficiency. Um, as long as you're keeping up on the cleaning and the changing, um, you're not going to do anything negative to the hummingbirds. Um, you're, it's mostly just, uh, you know, it, it gives them an extra source of food, especially if, you know, flowers get covered up with snow um, or they're just particularly cold days and they just need a quick, easy way to get a lot of energy. That's that's one way they do it. So um, I'm going to take my little friend here and ask her to go down for now. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Yeah. We can jump into those. Um, uh, one question is, what are the typical predators of hummingbirds? Mm. So, you know, um, the nests, uh, typical predators of the nests are, are other birds and squirrels. Um, red squirrels are, are a species that uh, are especially, you know, uh, they're, they're good nest predators. They eat the eggs, they eat the chicks. Um, and, you know, they're a native species. The two, uh, you know, kind of understand each other and how they work. And so, you know, it's a, it's a fight between the two on keeping the nest protected from them. Fox squirrels add in a new element because fox squirrels are not native to the Rockies. Um, they are an introduced species from the eastern part of the uh, uh, United States and Canada. You know, so their native range is further east and we have introduced them into the Rockies. And so fox squirrels add in a, a loop that is difficult. Um, uh, feral cats, another big predator. Um, but other than that, on the landscape, you know, even, even like predatory birds like Excipiters, Cooper's hawks, things like that, falcons. Hummingbirds are not worth the the chase, the struggle to capture them for the energy output because they're so small. Um, you know, in some places where uh, there are really big spiders with really big spider webs, um, I think throughout uh, like the the Gulf Coast states, and they call them uh, banana spiders, but they're they're orb weaving web spiders. They're really big garden spiders. Um, they they have these large webs, and they'll actually uh, be risky you know because if a hummingbird gets captured in them they they can be consumed by the spiders that are much larger than the ones we ever get here so here um spiders not really a big threat um you know at at uh flowers and feeders bees are actually somewhat of a threat because a bee sting can kill a hummingbird i know that sounds shocking but uh you know i mean a bee sting uh to the right human can can be fatal so um you know even to to something like a hummingbird because they're so small that little shock of venom can be a threat to them as well. So, you know, those are some of the more, more common ones, but really um, their most common threats are, you know, non-native animals, uh, habitat destruction, um, and, you know, things like window collisions. So if you're gonna have feeders or flowers near your windows, you know, consider uh, maybe treating your windows with some of the clear stickers that they, they make now that um, I'm looking out mine right now. I've got clear stickers on one window and I've got some UV ink on the other window. It's clear. I can still see out. I can see a goldfinch at my feeders right now. Doesn't obstruct my view, but it prevents birds from flying into your windows. So those are, those are some of the big ones. Um, and yeah, it's mostly things that uh, uh, aren't part of the native landscape that, that impact hummingbirds the most. So besides the bees, what else might someone see feeding at their nectar feeders? Um, you might you might have ants. Uh, some woodpeckers will come into them as well. Orioles will feed at uh, nectar feeders. Um, and then, of course, if you live in an area with bears, 
uh, you better you better have them out of the way from the Bears because Bears will come into them very quickly. And um, I have a question about when to remove the feeders in late summer. I can't remember if we cover that later in the conversation or not. Um, you know, feeders, you can keep them up throughout the summer um, unless you live, you know, if you live on the eastern side of the state out in the plains, um, you know, take them down maybe by by early to mid-June, most of the hummingbirds have migrated through already, but then you might want them up by mid-July because the rufous hummingbirds are already on their way back down. So, you know, but if you live throughout much of the western part of the state, um, central to western, you can probably leave your feeders up year-round and you might get a visitor um, just randomly throughout the summer. It's just a matter of, you know, the upkeep versus, you know, the, the enjoyment reward of the hummingbirds coming in. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's really just a, a matter of kind of where you're at and how long you want to leave them up and, and continue to, to deal with them. One thing I will encourage is, you know, most store-bought nectar um, is, is not, uh, it has the potential to be really harmful to hummingbirds. They put preservatives in it. They put dyes in it. Um, avoid nectars that use red dyes. You don't need red dye. I don't know why they felt the need to put that in when the feeders themselves are red, typically. Um, so I would say avoid store-bought nectars unless they say no dyes, no preservatives. And they are making some now where the, they're actually packaging them in a way that they don't require preservatives and they don't require dyes and it's just sugar and water. They're getting better about how they package them. Um, companies are being very innovative and trying to move away from the dyes um, and the preservatives. And so uh, if it has anything other than sugar and water, I would say avoid it. Even the ones that say like they have electrolytes in them avoid it. Sugar and water. I um, mean, if you're going to make it at home, you can you make it yourself. Uh, it's um, four to one water to sugar. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, you can, you can make it at home. And then uh, what I like to do is I like to make a bulk and then put a couple of uh, sealed, uh, you know, jars. I jar it, put it that in the fridge. Um, and so a couple of jars are stored in the fridge, ready to go and then use you know, whatever I have to fill the feeders and anything extra goes straight into the fridge right away. Um, and then I break it out when it's, when it's time to, to change them out. And that's one way then I can kind of keep up with that high demand um, of having to change out, especially during the hot days. Three to four days when the temperatures are you know, over 80, 85, early spring, late fall, you can usually stretch it a little bit further. But if you start to see anything forming in your feeder, it needs to come down, it needs to get Nectar changed and cleaned out. Good, good time to clean up the dinner table for your feathered friends. That's right. So uh, one more question from Facebook. Um, are there suggestions for attracting hummingbirds to denser residential areas as opposed to more rural out of town areas? Uh, so here, here's the, the best tips I can provide you. And that is corridors of habitat. So if you can get your neighborhoods to try to do more um, you know, native plantings, or if you can just make your yard a beacon. Remember, these birds are flying over at pretty high speeds, but what catches their attention is that reflection of UV light. And certain plants reflect, you know, in certain ways. And so certain plants are going to give off the, hey, I provide food to hummingbirds signal, and that's what they come to. So, you know, we, we're going to see here in a moment a before and after of a Habitat Hero Garden. You're going to see what it looked like before a typical, you know, maybe not typical, um, but, um, you know, a somewhat common, you know, site of, you know, an under tended undervalued just turf grass lawn, which hummingbirds have no use for. That's not going to attract anything. And you're going to see it, it changed to something then that would attract hummingbirds because it is a beacon of food and of protection. And so, um, you know, if you can get your neighbors or, you know, um, you know, neighborhoods to, to try to do more of that, creating these strips of native plants that produce food and shelter. It's the greatest way to, you know, encourage these birds to come in and nest in those areas because hummingbirds will nest near homes. They just need the habitat to do it. And the problem is we've removed so much of the native habitat that they require. So one more uh, question about the feeders and, and the end of the season. Um, is there any truth to leaving feeders out too long as it relates to endangering them to stick around too long or dying from the cold? No, no truth to that. Um, you know, there is, there is some evidence that suggests on the Gulf Coast, 
where the temperatures aren't impacting the hummingbirds um, at all that, you know, some hummingbirds are maybe sticking around the Gulf Coast a little bit longer, but it's because the climate there is acceptable. But here in the north, no, if you leave feeders out and a hummingbird comes in, it's not coming in and staying because your feeder is keeping it here. It's coming in because it got stuck somewhere in migration. It needs refueling and it's going to stay and refuel until it feels it can fly and it has optimal conditions for leaving. So either, either winter will hit and that hummingbird will not make it or it will leave. There is nothing your feeder is doing to keep it here. There is no truth to that in these northern parts, um, you know, especially the, the Rocky Mountain region. No, the hummingbirds leave when they can leave. And if a hummingbird feels like it cannot, then it will feed there longer. And if you can provide it a resource, it will use it. Um, and that's what it's doing is your resource is probably easier and less energy consumptive to feed at a feeder. And so it'll stay there longer, but it will not stay past the point that it knows it can go. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Let's uh, last last little bit here. The next steps. Um, so I'm just going to real quick do an overview of our, our Habitat Hero program, um, which is our our plants for birds, our, our native plants program that encourages people, you know, to convert, uh, you know, these these water sucking turf grass lawns, at least somewhat back into a more native, uh, you know, habitat that all forms of wildlife can use, right? Not just hummingbirds, but all forms of wildlife can use. Um, and so, um, you know, how can you participate? Uh, just you start, you start converting, you start planting, you start, you know, using those native plants. Um, there's resources. If you go to Audubon Rockies website, which is rockies.audubon.org, go to Habitat Hero, ample resources there. I'm sure Barnyards and Backyards also has resources on, on you, know, you know, turning your, your yard into you know habitat for for wildlife as well um, if you want the the sign that you saw in the previous slide um, uh, you fill out an application there's a, a small fee with it as well and then you know if you meet the requirements your yard can become a certified habitat hero yard um, and then there's a, a benefits package that comes with it um, and so you know, uh, the, the sign's a big thing. You get the Colorado Wyoming Wildscapes book. You get uh, the packet of wildflower seeds. There's a subscription uh, to, you know, the Plants for Birds and the Habitat Hero uh, newsletters, more educational materials, uh, catalogs. And then we have a story map also that highlights with photos, if you, if you want to share, all the amazing Habitat Hero gardens um, that are participating. And, and, you know, as we do this more and more, as more people get involved, not only are we saving water, but then we can start to reconstruct more native habitat in areas where we've developed. Um, and so this is that lawn I was talking about. You can see this is in uh, Littleton, Colorado. Um, and so this is the before photo. This is what that, you know, it's turf grass. Nothing is using this. Maybe a robin, right? Maybe a robin's running around out there after a rainstorm looking for an easy meal. But other than that, this lawn is, is not doing much for anything. Um, you know, and, and really, I don't know if it's doing much for the homeowner as well, other than maybe, you know, causing a high water bill, who knows? And this is the after. As you can see, they got rid of everything and they converted this all to uh, a variety. There's, there's native plants, there's probably some non-natives in here as well. It does not have to be 100% native plants in your Habitat Hero Garden, but we encourage folks to use as many natives as possible as part of it. Um, you can see there's even a, it looks like a little uh, a bee uh, be your pollinator house over there on the left side. You can see it on the pole there. Um, looks like, yeah, maybe for, for mason bees and leaf cutter bees to, to build their nests in. Um, so something there. Much um, more so, interesting for the humans to look at too. Right? Yeah. I'll go, let me go back one more time. Obviously the house also, it looks like got a little facelift with that too. Um, but this was the before and this was the after. Um, so yeah. Big steps there. Oh, I even see a toad house down here, uh, right down here in the lower central part. I see a little a little house for uh, toads to shelter in as well. So, uh, and you can see the Habitat Hero sign back here. Um, and so, you know, it's great just from a, a use standpoint. I mean, uh, you know, when you're sitting out on your front porch, what would you rather look at? Um, and, you know, think about, you know, what what can you do to maximize the enjoyment of your yard. Um, so for more information on the Habitat Hero program, um, there's the link to the Habitat Hero program, rockies.audubon.org slash Habitat Heroes. Um, maybe we can get that in the, the chat as well. Um, 
Jamie Weiss is our Habitat Hero coordinator. Although Jamie is currently out on maternity leave, we do have someone who's uh, filling in an extern from Colorado University at Boulder, uh, doing a great job. So um, if, you, if you reach out, you will be directed to someone who can help you through that process if you'd like to consider joining and becoming a Habitat Hero. Um, so uh, some, some recent scientific findings. Um, you know, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing changes uh, in, in the timing of our birds um, and, and some, of, some of their behaviors. Um, and so like ruby-throated hummingbirds, um, they're coming north earlier than maybe they had in, in previous times um, based on some, some plants maybe blooming earlier and, but then others are still not. And so their timing is changing. Um, Broadtail hummingbirds are being uh, pushed up the mountains into higher uh, elevations than they they typically would have, um, and again, it's all it's all just based on changes in the environment. You know, um, some human caused um, that it's it's changing the way these birds are behaving, and so and what what we're also seeing is is things then like black chin hummingbirds are who are large and aggressive, but then are pushing the broad tails up too, and we're seeing then in other species where um, some are hybridizing with other species and uh, trying to really. Uh, no, they're not trying. What they're doing is, you know, they're breeding with them because they're coming into contact in areas they would not have previously. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't know what the impacts of that will be long term. These are just things that we're seeing and we just don't know what that's going to mean for hummingbirds moving forward. Um, but some of these could be negative um, because, uh, you know, changing the timing of migration when um, maybe not all of uh, the plants or all of the regions are seeing the same change in timing it can lead to you know, detrimental impacts uh, when a hummingbird arrives in an area and doesn't have a food source. So um, just some things to consider, you know, having, having our gardens and, and you know, supplementing can be great ways to at least uh, provide some sort of food source for, for hummingbirds. Um, On the, the topic of the food sources again and uh, supplementing, we have a question about what's the best way or best products to clean the feeders with? Um, so with, with hummingbird feeders, Soap and water, hot, hot, hot soap and water. Um, that you need that hot, hot water to help uh, get that you know that glazed sugar off of everything. Um, do not use bleach with hummingbird feeders. Uh, with other bird feeders, you you hear to use a diluted bleach solution. Yes, with hummingbird feeders, no, um, because even a little bit of residue of bleach in that in that um, solution, right? So if a little bleach is stuck to the inside of that. That, to, that feeder, you know, that holds nectar, and then you pour the solution in, and then it, it uh, infiltrates into that, that uh, nectar solution, that little bit of bleach can cause a lot of harm to a small bird that has a high metabolism and drinks a lot of that nectar. So um, no bleach with hummingbird feeders. Maybe a low uh, acidity white vinegar, something like that. Um, you don't want to have a lot of vinegar in it, you know, a really diluted solution. That can help too, you know, that pH can help clear out some of that, that mold and mildew in the feeder. Um, but you can usually do a lot with just hot soapy water that is good enough, but it has to be really hot water um, to be effective against the mold and to get that old sugar out. And again, then if you wanna follow it up with a little vinegar solution soap or something like that, you can do that, um, but just try to uh, really dilute it really, really well. You don't want a lot of acidity in it because then again, if any of that acid sticks to the sides of your, your jar you know, that holds the nectar, and you pour the solution in, it could go back in the hummingbird could feed on it. Um, less detrimental if that happens, but um, still something to consider. Usually hot soapy water is good enough for most. Then it sounds like a good rinse is a good idea. Yeah, yeah, you'd be thorough with your rinsing. You don't want soap residue and you don't want vinegar residue left over. Give it a really, really good rinse. Um, they, make, they make brushes specific for hummingbird feeders, you know, little uh, little bristle brushes that you know, clean out the tubes, clean out the little feeding ports, things like that. Um, you can do it real quick and easy. Uh, you can, you know, find them in stores online, wherever. So uh, something Great. to consider, but yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, couple last resources here. eBird is a great way to track your hummingbird sighting. So when you get your first hummingbird, if you want to track it, and then the following year, look up to see when your first hummingbird arrives. Okay, what did it arrive last year? And when did it arrive this year? And you can compare dates. It's a, a fun tool to use to track your bird sightings. Um, it's a big community science tool. It's a great way to track birds 
um, look up, you know, information about birds and, uh, and just share a lot of the fun. So with that, if we have any final questions, let's get them in. And then uh, contact information here. Uh, this is for Jacqueline, um, who, again, was your rock star presenter for the day that was supposed to be here, but uh, unfortunately got stuck, up, was stuck with the backup vocalist. But hopefully you still learned something and had a good time. If you have any questions, you can email them to Jacqueline. My email is zach.hutchinson at audubon.org. Um, if we can put that in the chat, maybe um, uh, you can reach out to me as well. And then just the general Audubon Rockies contact stuff, you can find a way to contact me through our website um, as well. So uh, reach out with any questions you have. And if we have any more questions from today, uh, we can answer them. Well, I so think just, just to ahead. be sure that so, uh, we had comments about what it, a great program it was. So uh, your backup hitting did the, did, a, did the deed. So thank you very much. We, uh, we appreciate you filling in this morning and, and it went very well. Excellent. Well, thank you all. That was totally awesome. There was a couple of things I wanted to share before we stop today. And we just wanted to mention a pollinator guide that we have put out that if you want more information on particular plants, it covers both native and non-native plants in there. If you find the pollinator guide, you can find it online, but you can also visit our extension offices and they often have copies they'll hand out to you for free. And you can look at the different plants in the there and it'll give you different information to help you plan out your landscaping. And so the cover looks like this, if you haven't seen it before. So just walk into the office or you can visit our website. So this is the Barnyards and Backyards website. And if you go down here and you click on this pollinator guide, it'll take you right there. We also have several great articles that Jacqueline has written under this wildlife heading. So if you click on that and hit birds, you can see those awesome articles that she's produced. But for today, we thank you for being on the show today. If you're interested in more of these live programs, you can go visit the live link on our website and you can see that we're winding down the season and our next show will be our last and that's tips for growing in high tunnels but you could also see that we record these so if you have friends that wanted to watch it and missed it just come here i'll probably have it posted later today for today's and you can click on it and it'll be on youtube and you can watch it there donna if you want to wrap us up sure i have one more question for you zach um, as a pollinator do the hummingbirds get the pollen on their face around their their beak where they collect the nectar or does it just get on their feathers um, as they move around from flower to flower a great question and and both um, so when we actually when we band hummingbirds we track the the amount and coloration of the pollen i mean there are studies being done on on the pollen spreading of hummingbirds but when they dip their face in typically um, right up here at the base of their bill, um, there's, there's a little kind of sunken area. It's, it's almost like a pollen well, you, or you call it. Um, it's not what it's for, but that's where the pollen oftentimes gets stuck. It's right up at the base of the bill where the bill touches the face and then on top of the head feather. So sometimes you'll see hummingbirds where they have like this orange mohawk starting to form on the front of their head. And it's, it's not their plumage, it's the orange pollen sticking to them. Um, and they're carrying it around. And so you'll see hummingbirds with some discoloration on their on the base of their bill. And it, sometimes it'll spread all the way out to the tip of their bill and then on top of their head. And it's it's not, you know, something dangerous to hummingbirds. No, it's just the pollen sticking to them. And they're, you know, out doing the pollinator thing, spreading it around. So you'll see it stuck all over their face at times. Um, and, and because, you know, they are feeding on flowers, you will occasionally see parasites stuck to their faces as well. Don't worry. They can survive with them. Um, it's not a big deal. So if you see that, you know, don't fret for your, your hummingbirds. You know, the, the parasites that are on the plants that crawl onto them while they're feeding, it's, you know, it's a relationship that has been there for a lot longer than we have. So uh, don't worry about it. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll survive and they'll be fine. Um, and that pollen won't hurt them either. Very good. Well, thank you again for joining us today, Zach. And we hope you get feeling better very soon. Um, uh, for everyone else, thank you for joining us on Barnyards and Backyards Live and on Facebook Live for the presentation today. We'll um, hope that some of you get a chance to look at the recording and um, we'll look forward to Jeff's presentation on uh, growing in high tunnels for the next session. Thank you again for uh, joining us this season for the Barnyards and Backyards Live presentations.